Good morning. You may be seated. What a beautiful day outside. What a great time to be here together at camp meeting. We're so glad to see all of you out this morning. Have a real treat in store for you this morning. Uh, our speaker this morning is Pastor Andre Weston. He's from the uh, Defuniac Springs, Emerald Coast, Fort Walton area. Uh, I, as education superintendent, I get to know a lot of our pastors well, but some I get to know better than others because they have a school in their district. And I've just really come to appreciate getting to know Andre, and I know the Lord's going to be with him this morning. Pastor, if you come on out, I want to have prayer with you, and uh, we'll turn the time over to Pastor Weston. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful that we have this opportunity to be here with you this morning. We love you. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to just worship you in a special way today. I just pray that your spirit will be here with Pastor Andre, that you'll descend upon him, that his words will be your words, and that we'll all draw closer to you from having been here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, I almost want to say happy Sabbath. It's just you say good morning and then you say happy Sabbath. But we're not there yet, but praise God is coming. Uh, I'm so thankful that you made time on your Thursday morning to be here. God has something for you, something for you individually. The Holy Spirit speaks when his word is opened up, and I'm so thankful to be able to uh, stand in this pulpit and share uh, together. Um, I do want to thank, uh, you know, the executive team of the Gulf States Conference, uh, Elder Fancher, Elder Denise, uh, Elder Livermore, Elder Hobbs, uh, for extending this invitation. I joined the Gulf States family just last year, and uh, camp meeting is certainly one of the things that I certainly look forward to, and so I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Um, my wife, Nicole, and I, as, as, uh, as was said, we're in the Fort Walton Beach area, and we're just proud to be part of the the Lord's Last Day message in the Northwest Florida Panhandle and joining you guys in the conference. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about spiritual decay. We're going to talk about indicators of things that are not going well and what we can do about them. Because if we are to be carrying out the gospel commission, we have to be spiritually healthy. Amen? spiritually growing and spiritually sound in Christ. And so the title of today's message is called Flies in the Sanctuary, Removing Spiritual Decay from Our Churches. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about creating a culture of acceptance in our churches. God cares about what's going on in our churches and in our lives. And before I continue, I'm just going to say uh, another prayer. Dear God, it's your words, not my own. And I ask that you would help me and guide me as we go forward this morning, that Jesus Christ might be lifted up and that all might see a picture of him that is compelling. In his name we pray. Amen. Flies. Nobody likes them. They're a nuisance. They cause problems. When flies are in the environment, something is wrong in the environment. Uh, flies tend to be attracted to decay. Uh, if something is dead or dying, the flies will be there before the vultures check in. So when we see flies, we get upset, as we should. A fly in the house disturbs us. Now, I don't know how you dealt with flies in your younger days or how you deal with flies today, but when I was a kid, the method that we used to get rid of flies was to turn out the lights. Turn out all the lights except for one central light in the house, and that was usually the TV. Because you knew that once the lights were out and the TV was left on, what would that fly do? He would gravitate towards that TV screen to get a front row seat of what you've been viewing. And then when he was on that square, you could get him. A fly in the house had to de be dealt with. Flies remind us a lot, remind me a lot of when things are going wrong. 
Like I said moments ago, decay attracts flies. And I'm going to submit to you this morning that there are two kinds of decay that affect the whole human family. The first is physical decay, and we are familiar with that. Physical to get decay. Those who are born will someday die. The hair will grow gray and turn white. Standing up straight will be replaced with bending over. And eventually, the grave will claim us. We live in a sin-fallen world, and the curse of death is on us. And physical decay, the curse of death, was the lot that mankind chose when we cast our disobedience in Eden. But the Christian need not fear physical decay or death. Because of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, those who trust in him, though they are dead, yet shall they live. That's why Job observed in Job chapter 19, verse 26, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, in my flesh I shall, I shall see God. Job wasn't afraid of physical decay, and I would submit to you today that if you have called your election sure, if your hope is in Christ Jesus, you also need not fear death for the hope of the resurrection. So this first type of decay is defeated by the hope of the resurrection, and it only has a limited impact on our churches. People will die, but babies will be born. It's the second kind of decay that has a larger and more detrimental impact on our homes and on our churches. What am I talking about? I'm talking today about spiritual decay. Now, sometimes we resist the idea that spiritual decay could be happening in our environment because we may say, but we're Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We have the health message. We have the three angels message. We have the doctrine of the sanctuary. We keep the Sabbath. We are the remnant. The other churches, they're the ones that are apostatizing. The other churches, they are the ones that are decaying. And yet, when we're honest, friends, we struggle to retain our young people sometimes, don't we? We lose our newly baptized members sometimes, don't we? We assassinate the character of our fellow brethren through gossip sometimes, don't we? We fight for our preferences instead of his purposes in our committees sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we're the last to support evangelism in the local church and the first to say it doesn't work. Sometimes, friends, we police our members and seek to create in them the image of ourselves instead of the image of the only begotten Son of God. The truth is, spiritual decay is affecting our churches. Where the Lord's work is established, so you will find the enemy of souls sowing his tares. So we have to be on guard and we have to be alert that our spiritual lives don't begin to decay. And the environment of spirituality in our church doesn't begin to demise. So this morning, I'm going to outline four flies in the sanctuary, four kinds of spiritual decay, four indicators that something spiritually wrong is going out. And I want to uh, acknowledge that, that there are many examples of spiritual decay, but we're just going to focus on four, and then we're going to propose four solutions, four tools, four things we can do about spiritual decay. The first one I want to talk about this morning is misuse of funds or money or finances. You see, God in his graciousness has given us so much. And all he has asked for us is that we return what he first gave to us. And we're well aware of what the Bible says in Matthew, excuse me, Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. You can turn with me to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, and also keep another thumb on Matthew 21, 12 and 13. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. The prophet speaks beginning in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, 
In what way have I robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Sometimes we don't give because we have spent already the tithe money. Sometimes we don't give because we want to express our disdain with our dollars. But what we have to remember, friends, is returning to the Lord his tithes and his offerings is a spiritual act. It was never about you and the church, you and any other individual. Your tithing and your offerings are about you and the Lord. God in Malachi 3, 8 and 9 reminds us that withholding our funds is considered a high crime and misdemeanor against heaven. In fact, the word that is used there is robbery. You have robbed me and you are a cursed nation because you are not returning what has been given to you. When we are not honoring God with our finances, it's a fly in the sanctuary. It's a sign of spiritual decay in our personal lives. But withholding funds is not the only indicator that something is wrong. Sometimes it comes down to how we use the funds, how we actually use them. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 12. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 21, beginning in verse 12. The Bible reads, beginning in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, and all of my texts this morning are from the New King James Version. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. The Bible then says, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You see, what was happening in the temple was these money changers, they were doing a currency exchange. They were taking one form of currency, they were converting it to another, but they were doing it in a way to reap a profit for themselves. Their financial interaction was centered on how can I enrich myself? How can I advocate for myself? How can I get what I want? How can I keep myself at the center of my financial expression of what God has given me? And when our financial practices are all about us, we fail to honor God. That's a fly in the sanctuary. When God, when our use of God's money is for our profit, we become a den of thieves. Jesus reminds us that how we use money does matter and is a spiritual issue. That's why the gospel tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your heart or where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That's not a foreign concept. We know that, right? Businesses know that. Politicians know that. They know that budgets are expressions of the heart. Your tithing and your offering and your local church budget is an expression of the heart. Where is the heart of your local church budget? Where is the heart of your ministry budget? Ask the question, is my church budget funding the things that bring new people into membership and spiritually strengthens the members that we have? Are we using his money for his purposes or are we fighting for sacred cows and pet projects and, and, and other things that do not honor the Lord? When money is withheld and when money is used inappropriately, that is a fly in the sanctuary, second fly in the sanctuary, and this one is probably the closest to home, abandoning personal time with God. There is nothing more detrimental you can do to your walk with Christ Jesus than to abandon your time with him. I don't know about you guys, but my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving because I love autumn and I love fall uh, and I love family and I love food. And all those things come together every year in November. I love Thanksgiving and millions of people around the nation also say, yeah, Thanksgiving, that's my favorite holiday. But then there are some who say, 
Thanksgiving is an awkward time for me. It's just like those family reunions that we have that are awkward. And the reason Thanksgiving is awkward is because at Thanksgiving, I have to sit down at a table with people whom I have not spoken to in a year. People who I have issues with, my family members, and we don't talk, and we're not close. So the meal is not surrounded by good memories. I mean, imagine if you only saw your wife once a week. Husbands, you'd be sad. Imagine if you only saw your husband once a week. Wives, you wouldn't like that very much, and you couldn't really call that a relationship that's going anywhere. You see, our walk with Jesus is a relationship that's going somewhere, and so he wants us to spend time with him. You ever been flipping through the TV, and uh, all of a sudden, one of the commercials is an ad, a political ad. We get out of a political cycle, praise God, but those ads were there through the whole process, right? And sometimes those ads will say things like, this candidate voted against this bill. He doesn't have your values. Or this candidate doesn't have the same religion as you. He's going to take away your freedom. Or this candidate dropped out of Boy Scouts without ever earning a merit badge. Do you really want a quitter in office? And it seems silly sometimes, the angle at which they attack one another and bring down the opposition, but I would tell you that political ads are some of the most strategic and intelligent things your eyeballs will ever see on TV. And guess what, y'all? They work. They wouldn't spend millions of dollars if these things didn't work. And how do we know they work? Because political ads are what we call poll tested. That means before the ad ever flickered across your TV screen, a group of seven to 10 people from your community, from your region, were gathered together in what's called a focus group, and they were asked a series of questions, and messages were tested in advance for effectiveness, and typically, the responses of that seven to 10 sampling group does represent the larger population that they're from. So by asking the smaller group, they can determine the sentiments of the larger group. So I've got homework from you, for you. Maybe you're an elder, maybe you're a layman, uh, maybe you're a pastor. When you leave camp meeting and you go back to your church, I want you to ask seven to 10 people in your church, how often do you spend time with God in personal devotion? If the average answer is low, and people are spending about, uh, you know, one hour a week in personal devotion, the average answer, then you can project that that's where your church's personal devotion life is. If the answer is high, somewhere, you know, around 21 hours a week, that's three hours a day in personal devotion with God, right? Then you can project that your church is a well-oiled machine. It's a gathering of people who have connected with God through the week. You see, Sabbath is supposed to be the overflow of six days of walking with Jesus. But for many people, Sabbath is where people intake all of their experience with Jesus. And so what that means is when that door opens Sabbath morning, and someone says, happy Sabbath, glad to see you. Through those doors are pouring people who have not connected with Christ all week. And so no wonder sometimes there are missteps. No wonder sometimes we're unkind. No wonder sometimes we miss the mark because we come to the church starving to be fed. When we should come to the church fed to share, there's a difference. If we're abandoning our personal time with God, it's an indicator that something is spiritually wrong. That's the second fly in the sanctuary. The third one, abandoning our mission of service. Did you know that when you were baptized, you were inducted into something? You were given a mission, a gospel commission to take this good news to all the earth 
and preach the good news of the everlasting kingdom. It was a mission, not a spectator sport, something that we all had to take part in. And our mission is a mission of service because, you see, Jesus said, go. And sometimes we think that means go and preach, meaning the go is simply a verb of move, right? But if we really want to understand what is expected of us by the go, we must look at the one who went. Look at Jesus. Look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What did he do as he went? What did go mean to Jesus? For Jesus, go means I'm going to touch you and you can see. Go means you are hungry, so I feed you. Go means I know you're one of society's untouchables, but I see you and I'm going to touch you. Go means I know that you come from a group of people that have this reputation, but you've got a clean slate with me. I want to come to your house. Go meant meeting practical human needs, our mission of service. Service is so incredibly important. See, we, we're very familiar with Matthew 24 because that's when the disciples said, Jesus, how is this thing going to wrap up? When are you coming? And what will be the signs of your coming and the signs of the end of age? And he started talking and prophetically talking about the end of the age and things that would come. And we're, we're well acquainted with Matthew 24. But in Matthew 25, something interesting happens. Jesus has a discussion about the characteristics of those who will enter God's everlasting kingdom and those who will not enter God's kingdom. Let's look specifically at Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at five verses, verses 31 through 36. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 36. can say amen when you get there. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 36. The, and the Bible reads, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And, 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 and it goes on after that. I was in prison and you came to me, verse 36. This is significant, friends, because Jesus makes it clear that the expectation of those who are going to be with him for eternity is that on the earth they were feeding the hungry. On the earth they were visiting those in prison. On the earth they were encouraging the discouraged. They were a presence in the lives of the neglected. They practiced Christian service. And you know how... The next verses go to those who have everlasting condemnation. He says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. In prison and you, you didn't visit me. I was naked and you offered me no clothes. You gave no Christian service. You didn't reach out to me. You didn't show me that you cared by actions of love. The reason why abandoning our mission of service is an indicator that something is spiritually wrong is because Jesus takes service personally. That's why he concludes, what you've done to the least of these, you did that to me. I take it personally. You did it on to me. We must be the hands and feet of Jesus, the going and the doing last day church. A message of preaching backed up by actions of love. The fourth fly is self righteousness. Self righteousness. Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. 
chapter 18, and we'll look at verses 9 through 14. You can say amen when you arrive at Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. The Bible says, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up on the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the conclusion states, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice the audience for the parable is those who considered themselves righteous and despised others. When you consider yourself righteous and rely on yourself for righteousness, you will despise others because you block off that connection with Christ, that reliance on his righteousness, and you start doing it my way according to myself and relying on me. And then it overflows to the people around you, and you start expecting them to do it your way and be like you. And when they're not, you exclude them and you push them away. And self-righteousness is an indicator that something is spiritually wrong. Because if there's anything we know about Jesus Christ, he was selfless. He humbled himself like a servant. He bore our crisis, our, our, our burdens. He was a man of sorrows. And when he was mistreated, he opened not his mouth. Selfless. So self-righteousness is a problem. When we have a congregation or a home full of people saying, I'm glad I'm not like those kind of people. I'm glad I don't eat what he eats. I'm glad I don't lust after what he lusts after. I'm glad that I don't worship like they worship. I'm so glad I'm not like them. We are suffering from a form of spiritual decay. Oh, if we had people who would pray the tax collector's prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A contrite heart before the Lord. Okay. Y'all hung with me so far. I appreciate it. I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, right? So now that I've pointed out four flies in the sanctuary, I'm not just going to let those flies buzz around. Because you're thinking about your home churches and your families and you're thinking about situations that are close to home. And you may have recognized some of these signs of spiritual decay. But I want you to go back to your churches empowered with these four fly swatters. These four fly swatters. The first is a heart of stewardship. A heart of stewardship. If the fly in the sanctuary is not returning tithes and offerings and misusing what the Lord has given you for selfish purposes, then the fly swatter is practicing good stewardship, which comes from a heart of stewardship. A Christian author, C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, is quoted as saying, Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or moving your limbs from moment to moment, is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. God is the chief owner. Everything we have, he has given to us. Our children are his. Our money is his. Our time is his. Our bodies are his. He is the owner. And when we really understand that God owns not just the cattle on a thousand hills, but the grass on which those cattle are grazing and every other thing as far as the eye can see, then scales fall from our eye and our worldview should shift dramatically. And we should realize that that everything 
is different. Now, when I have a heart of stewardship and I recognize God is the owner, when I see that out-of-tune piano in my sanctuary, then I say, that piano, it's the Lord's piano. When I see the carpet with the stains in my Sabbath school classroom, I say, that carpet is the Lord's carpet. And when I, when I see that church sign that still says, Happy New Year, even though it's May, I realize that sign is the Lord's sign. And I have a high standard for excellence. And I say, in the house of God, things should be well and decent and in order. And in my pocketbook, I should gladly return to him what he has given to me. It's not even mine. It's his. If I mishandle it, I'm mishandling him. When you recognize that everything is his, your eyes are open, friends, and you go through your church and you flot the swy of non-giving and you swat the fly of misuse of funds with the fly swatter of stewardship. And eventually what will happen is the flies who have stopped giving and the flies who give politically, and the flies who seek a profit for themselves, they will be driven out by the fly swatters of cheerful givers who believe that the house of God should be well-funded, that evangelism is worth investing in, and that a regular tithe and a liberal offering is the least we can do for a God who paid it all for you and I. The first fly swatter is a heart of stewardship. The second fly swatter is earnest Prayer. Do y'all believe that prayer changes things? I'm a witness. Prayer changes things, right? If the fly is abandoning your personal time with God, then the fly swatter is praying earnestly for a personal revival. We must be on our knees in prayer that the Lord will come through and show up and show out and make all things new and give the change we are so desperate for. The disciples were desperate in Acts chapter 2. In fact, in the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 37, uh, it says, these days of preparation, these are the days leading up to Pentecost, were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. When was the last time you were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls? They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Jesus Christ had promised. When we realize I haven't been spending time with Jesus the Holy Spirit has brought that to your recollection so you can do something about it. So you will be driven to your knees and pray for that holy unction and cry to the Lord, Lord, save me. Sometimes you can wander so far off from Jesus that you don't even know the first step to take to get back to him. But that's okay. You don't have to have it all figured out. Like Peter, all he knew is he was sinking. All he knew is he was drowning. And so he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus saved him. If your church is sinking, cry out, Lord, save us. If your personal walk with Christ is going down, Lord, save me. Because when you feel your spiritual need, friends, God can and will fill you with his spirit, and that spirit will lead you to his word. And you will find the bread of life, which is sufficient to fill you. The third fly swatter is Christian service. If the fly swatter is that you stop serving your community, you stop meeting human needs, you stop acknowledging the desperate situation of those around you, then the fly swatter is Christian service. Did you know that when you meet the needs of your fellow man, you 
put yourself in a position to receive a special blessing from God. Isaiah chapter 58 gives us an example of this. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 10 and 11. Turn with your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 58, verses 10 and 11. The Word of God reads, beginning in verse 10. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness will be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. God is saying if you extend yourself to someone in need, then the darkness that's in your soul the spiritual decay that you were suffering because you have not opened his word or witnessed about him in so long, that darkness will be like the noonday. And you, as you serve others, will have a light that they can see. You will be like a watered garden whose waters never fail. God's blessing is on those who don't just know his word informationally, but do his word with practical acts of Christian service. When we start getting to the work of helping others, we remove that sign of spiritual decay when we said it was all about me, all about me, all about me. The final fly swatter is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness. Self-righteousness is a serious problem. And if our problem is we have self-absorbed mentality going on, then the solution is to get back to a Christ-centered way of thinking. The mind of Christ. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. The mind of Christ who said, who can I help today? The mind of Christ who said, I love you. The mind of Christ who said, I want to be about my father's business. If we're about our father's business, we will share and show the love of Jesus. Philippians verses three, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 articulates it a little further. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Paul speaking, writes, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost, for the excellence of knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him. And then he goes on to say, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. His reliance was on righteousness by faith, in Christ Jesus. We are saved by grace. That means he elected to save us. He chose to. He was gracious through faith in Jesus Christ. His righteousness is what makes the difference. The world doesn't need to see your righteousness. The world needs to see you covered in Christ's righteousness. The world doesn't need to see you lifted up. The world needs to see Jesus lifted up. And then men will be drawn to him. Christ's righteousness is the cure for self-righteousness. If the fly in the sanctuary is that, is that the folk, the saints are, are, are coming in self-centered, having spent no time with Jesus Christ, and it's all about them, then the fly swatter is that you would stand up and say, it's all about him, not me. Jesus did it for me. Jesus covered me. Jesus made a way. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's rely on him. It's relying on him that made all the difference. In closing, friends, I want to talk to you a little bit about kayaking. My wife and I like to go kayaking. We came down here from Maryland and 
we were more comfortable going kayaking in Maryland than in Northwest Florida. And the reason is, in Northwest Florida, there are critters that have long snouts and pointy teeth and long tails. And so <clears throat> I often told my church members, I'm going to go kayaking someday. <clears throat> but I didn't put a date on it because I first needed to be convinced that the waters of Northwest Florida were safe. And I couldn't find a person who could, without reservation, confirm to me, you will not see an alligator on your kayaking trip. But eventually, I was convinced. And, and, and so we went kayaking, and we had a great time kayaking. And there were no gators, praise God. We were just streaming along the river kayaking, right? Doing that little kayak thing, right? And I noticed something because there are springs in northwest Florida that feed the water underground. And so you will find under, underwater rivers that feed into the river. And the effect that it has on the river is that some of the water is crystal clear. I mean, it's like a snapshot out of Eden. It's almost like the curse never touched that spot of the water. And right next to it is this line of dark, murky, regular river water. And I thought that is the most amazing thing. And so as we went along and we passed these springs and these clear patches of water, I noticed that there were bass fish that were gathering in the clear water. And so I asked one of the, the people who accompanied us on this trip, why are the fish in the clear water? And he said, well, it probably has to do with the temperature. There's a temperature change, which is why the dark stays over there and the light stays over here. And the bass seem to like the cooler temperature of the spring water. And I got to thinking, friends, that's exactly what happened in the human story. You see, in Eden, Adam and Eve made a choice for all of us. Their choice was to disobey God. And when they disobeyed God by partaking of the fruit of that tree, everything went dark, like a power failure in a thunderstorm. The whole world was darkened by the curse of sin. But then Jesus came into the world, the light of the world. And ever since Christ came into the world, he has been calling bass fish like Andre Weston out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. And evidently, when a bass fish comes out of the darkness and into the light, and someone says, why are you over there when you used to be over there? He says, I can't explain it, but it feels different here. The temperature is different here. The environment is different here. This is where I need to be and that bass over his overflow should go and tell other bass fish come out of the darkness and into his marvelous light and that's the gospel work friends we've got to call people out of the darkness and into his light that's why there are churches on the earth to do this work to do this mission so we cannot afford to be self-centered we cannot afford to withhold our financial support of his work. We cannot afford to not have a regular devotional life. We cannot afford to discontinue Christian service because the stakes are high. The time is nigh. Christ is coming with his angels and glory, and he's coming for a spotless church, and he wants to take her home, and he expects a huge return on his investment. And oh, what an investment it was. It was at great cost that Jesus spread out his arms and said, I will lay down my life for them. It was at great cost that he descended from heaven, came to the earth, modeled how we should submit to the Father, gave down his life, died a sinner's death, but rose and gave us the hope of eternal life. It was a high price, and it's a high calling from the pastor. And I don't like, <clears throat> excuse me. And I don't like to say on down, because we're all working together. But from the pastor to the layman to the conference officials, worldwide, we're all doing the same thing. United in Christ for his work. So if you are recognizing indicators of spiritual decay in your church, I would submit to you this morning that the reason you recognize that is because the Holy Spirit is telling you 
to work with him to do something about it. Make a difference where you are. Shine a light in the darkness. God bless you. Before I close with prayer, I want to encourage you to come back tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, we will have part two of this morning series, Moths in the Sanctuary. Flies in a sanctuary. Tomorrow we're going to talk about moths in a sanctuary. What's a moth? Well, it's not quite a butterfly. Doesn't have the reputation of a butterfly. But the thing about moths is the reason they are around is because in spite of their reputation, they're attracted to the light. So what do you do when you've got a moth in your church? We're going to talk about creating a culture of acceptance in our churches. I look forward to seeing you all. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. He is the unifying force which has brought us here together. Help us to submit and surrender our lives to him, to be transformed into the likeness of your son, so that when, when you look down in our churches, you see the image of your son and say, that's good. When you look down in our homes, you see the image of our son and say, that's good. Help us to do everything that we can to be good stewards of the churches that we represent and to prosper and grow by the power of the Holy Spirit where we are planted. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you.